Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 901, Wednesday, September 18th, 2019. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, let's go ahead and get to it. Uh, the first, <laughs> first story of the day, the first story of the day, if I can speak properly, uh, is one that we've been kind of following a little bit here and there over the past few months, but it appears now, finally, after so many stories about this going back and forth, it appears now we do have the evidence that Elon Omar did marry her brother. And she is using a fake name and she did enter the country illegally. She had put up a tweet in 2003 and I understand another tweet in 2013. And these were tweets to her father whose name is Nur Said. S-A-I-D, Nur, N-U-R, S-A-I-D, said, and Elon, the real name, is actually Elon Nur said Elmi, E-L-M-I. That is her real name. She did, in fact, marry her brother. She did, in fact, come into the country uh, using an illegal name. She is not an Omar. Omars are a completely different family. But you can read through in the story how the Omars allowed uh, said, in this case, Elon said, and her fellow siblings to enter into the U.S. Her and two of her other siblings came to the U.S. using the Omar name. Three more went to the U.K. So it looks like there is no more doubt anymore that the evidence is there that Omar is in fact not her name. It is said, S-A-I-D, she is Ilhan Nur Said Elmai is her real name. She did marry her brother <laughs> and she did enter the country illegally. So I don't know where this goes from here. Uh, I don't know how many people in DC even care, but it seems to me to be pretty important. I mean, if she's a fraud, then she's a fraud serving in Congress and she's a problem. Certainly she should never be reelected, but I haven't really heard anybody since the story come out, I've not heard that there's gonna be any legal actions taken, but it seems to me there should be by the Naturalization and Immigration Service, she committed fraud. There's also some issues with marrying your brother. Uh, there's a lot of issues. She's got these campaign uh, finance issues. There's a lot of problems with this uh, particular woman that need to be sorted out. So we'll continue to follow the story, but it looks like now after months and months of story after story uh, making these claims, it appears that the evidence is now clear that this is exactly what is true. So we'll keep watching and see where it goes. I don't know how many of you had a chance to watch the hearings, <laughs> the Penguins hearings with Corey Lewandowski but uh, of course I was working all day, so, uh, but I did come home and watch about a 15 or 20 minute uh, highlight reel. <laughs> oh my, my. Just from the 20 minutes I saw, if the whole hearings were like that, and I understand the entire thing was a clown show, then it looks like to me that uh, the penguin jumped right out of the uh, clown car, right into the clown frying pan. And this, he excuse me, this hearing uh, was pretty much about as, just as effective, if not worse than, the Cohen hearing, the Mueller hearing, or the John Dean, the rat of Watergate, the rat of Watergate, John Dean, any of those three hearings. They were all uh, fairly humorous, but this may have been the most humorous of, uh, of, the, of, of all. This was quite funny because Corey Lewandowski, quite honestly, was playing with them. And so there's quite a few clips you can watch. Uh, one of my favorite clips was, was Swalwell. <laughs> Remember him, Swalwell? He dropped out of the... Uh, the hardcore anti-gunner who dropped out of the uh, race a, a while back. So he's questioning Lewandowski, and apparently Lewandowski has a habit of whenever the president would give him some information that he would write down on a note card or on, on some sort of note paper, he would put it in his safe. And so Spalwell <laughs> is asking Lewandowski about, you know, do you make it a point every time that you take a, a note from a meeting with the president to put it in your safe. <laughs> and Lewandowski looks back at Swalwell and goes, yeah, well, he goes, um, 
uh, it's a, it's a, it's a big safe. It's a big safe. I have a lot of guns in there. <laughs> Which, you know, just saying the word guns to swallow well is enough to make him, uh, you know, uh, you know, lose his hair or something. So anyway, it was pretty funny the way that Lewandowski handled himself quite well, by the way, <clears throat> from what I saw. And of course it was just a shit show. That's what it was. And I have to commend some of the Republicans there. Um, they did a fantastic job of just completely turning the hearings into a, a mess, a complete mess. They were objecting, points of order, reading rules, questioning things, interrupting. They were doing everything they could to annoy the hell out of Nadler and the Democrats on that committee. They just turned it into a complete shit show is what it was. I mean, it's, it, was, it was comic, comic relief. Uh, this is how all these hearings are going to go. They're not going to get anything. And, any, and, and what they really wanted was uh, to get Lewandowski to, to talk about the conversations or, or things he, he had directly with the president. Of course, Lewandowski was advised by the White House counsel not to discuss any of his private conversations with the president. So the number one main thing that all the Democrats were loaded for bear to go after was completely nullified from the very beginning. Now, here's another observation that I make uh, from those hearings, from the questions that I saw. I can tell you right now that it wasn't any of those Democrats on the committee that wrote or created any of the questions that they were asking. Those questions were created by the lawfare uh, guys, the lawfare lawyers who were sent to that committee uh, to, to do the uh, background dirty work. They wrote those questions and all these Democrats did was read them. And you can tell because they could read the question, but once Lewandowski responded, and we've seen this before, once you respond, uh, they don't know how to respond back because they never created the original question. They're, all, they're way over their head. They, they're able to read the question, but that's it. They don't really understand it, where it comes from in law or anything else. They're just reading questions that were given to them by the lawfare guys. So they really can't do any actual follow-up, and anyone who's smart enough to understand what's going on can totally um, uh, uh, blunt them at uh, what they're trying to do. And that's what Lewandowski did. And he made it look easy, quite honestly. So you can expect more of this as this shit show continues. But uh, yeah, the video clip I watched was quite entertaining. I'm sure if any of you watched that today, you probably had a good time. May have been a popcorn event. <laughs> but there's more coming, believe me. Well, we have the rotten Reverend Clinton. Uh, boy, the demonic buzzard. She was hovering yesterday uh, at the um, George Washington University, still whining about 2016. It's been three years, and she is still whining about losing in an embarrassing fashion in 2016 to Trump. <laughs> so she told the George Washington University audience that she is counseling 2020 Democrats on how to run a successful campaign. <laughs> <laughs> now, I happen to remember that there were many, many Democrats who were running for Congress in 2016 who didn't want the, the, who didn't want the rot, rotten Reverend Clinton or her husband coming anywhere near them when they were campaigning for re-election. <laughs> and now she's saying that all these Democrats are counseling her on how to run a successful campaign. Something tells me that's total bullshit. I bet there's not a single Democrat asking the rotten Reverend for advice. <laughs> <laughs> on how to run a successful campaign. She got beat by a guy who spent half as much money as she did and has no political experience whatsoever. And we were told just an hour before the polls opened that morning that, that he had zero chance of winning and uh, that Hillary had a 99 point whatever percent chance of winning the election. She was never supposed to lose to Trump. Never. That's why she can't handle the loss. It's so embarrassing her that she just can't admit it. Cannot admit it. She's never gotten over it and she never will. She's got her eyes focused on 2020 so Trump can beat her again. <laughs> and he's going to beat her worse than he did last time. She says that voter suppression, <laughs> voter suppression, fake news stories, and the Electoral College contributed to her loss. <laughs> And she says that she lost Michigan and Wisconsin because of voters purged from the from the voter rolls. 
<laughs> Two states controlled by Democrats. <laughs> Yet somehow the Republicans managed to purge Democrats from the rolls. That can't happen. <laughs> she never even went to Wisconsin to campaign. Not once. <laughs> this woman is nuts, man. God, I hope she runs. Ugh. Man, oh man, what a good time we're going to have in 2020. Hey, regardless of who runs in 2020, whether it's uh, Biden, whether it's the Rotten Reverend, whether it's uh, uh, Chief Liawatha, uh, Chief Spreading Bull, whatever you want to call it, uh, Bernie, it doesn't matter. Uh, any of these people, <laughs> any of these people against Trump, it's going to be so much fun. Okay. So yesterday we were talking about Max Steyer and uh, his connections to the Clintons and the fact that he defended Slick Willie. He's the guy that made the accusation uh, in the New York Times fake news story that they had to retract, um, uh, you know, the slander against Kavanaugh. And uh, so I was mentioning that he, of course, represented Slick Willie in the Paula Jones case and that he also represented the rotten Reverend Clinton in Whitewater. Uh, I forgot to mention one other thing uh, is that um, during the, uh, I think it was the Kavanaugh was an opposing attorney. He was, that's right, he was working for, in the Whitewater case, uh, Ken Starr was the prosecutor. Kavanaugh actually worked on Starr's team. <laughs> Just another a uh, tidbit of information. Another reason why Max Steyer probably uh, has it in for Kavanaugh. Just a point I forgot to mention as I was going through that yesterday. So, watching CNN with Jake Crapper, and he's got three Democrats on a panel, and they're talking about Joe Biden. <laughs> and basically, the segment starts off with uh, Jake Crapper laying out how there are now some very, uh, fairly heavy hitters in the Democratic Party, high-level Democratic uh, people, calling out Joe Biden and questioning whether or not he can actually get it done. Of course, we know he can't. And so he's got this panel, <clears throat> and he, before he goes in and starts talking to the people on the panel, he plays a clip uh, and of course the clip is an audio clip and he doesn't disclose the name of the Obama administration official who this statement is being uh, credited to. But this is supposedly, according to Jake Crapper, this is a, a statement from an unnamed former Obama administration official about Biden. Quote, Biden's strength has never been his clarity of message or his delivery. <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> but watching his long, winding answers that don't really make sense in recent debates has also raised the question as to whether uh, that he has gotten worse and whether he is up to this. <laughs> and that is the question that he uses to tee off the, uh, the uh, conversation with these three Democrats who are pundits. And uh, essentially, they say what pretty much everyone else is saying is no, Biden simply, you know, he's lost his fastball, I guess, however you want to put it. Uh, I don't think he ever had one, but uh, anyway, this is basically the conversation. So as I said uh, several weeks ago, I said sometime uh, in, in the uh, late summer, early fall, that the Rotten Reverend Clinton would give the order to Maggie Haberman at the New York Times. She would write the first story, and that would get the ball rolling, and uh, that would be the beginning of the take out Biden so that they can clear the way for the rotten reverend, the draft Hillary campaign. And I said that this is pretty much how it would happen, and this is exactly what is happening. First, we had the New York Times piece about uh, three weeks ago or so. Then that was followed up by the Washington Post piece. Then you had a follow-up New York Times piece. Then you had the, sal the uh, Salon. You had the big piece in Rolling Stone. Uh, then you finally had the network news. We had CBS come out with their story. Now we've got MSNBC with uh, Joe and Crazy Mika uh, questioning uh, Uncle Joe. We have now got CNN questioning uh, Crazy Uncle Joe. We have everybody now 
everybody now falling in line. And the Rotten Reverend's got to be pretty pissed because she's already dropped some pretty heavy artillery on uh, Crazy Uncle Joe. But he's still in, 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 in the RCP polls. He's still on the average polls. He's still the leader. Uh, but you keep seeing these polls coming out of New Hampshire, Iowa, uh, California, where they're doing these primary states, just statewide polls. And I'm not sure who's commissioning them. But these statewide polls are showing something much different than these national polls. So this is always uh, interesting. But um, anyway, uh, there's no question that the uh, operation to take out Crazy Uncle Joe to clear the way for the Rotten Reverend is clearly underway, and it has been now for about three, four weeks. And this is going to intensify, I expect, through the next two weeks uh, toward the end of September. And then, and then if, if he isn't thoroughly weakened by then, I think in October you're going to see him really drop the hammer hard. The Rotten Reverend will say, okay, that's it. You know, no more Mr. Nice Guy. Pound this guy. Pound him into the ground. He has to be gone by October 31st because the Rotten Reverend needs to file the papers. They've got six weeks to take him out. And I think she's going to tell him to really uh, stand on it here very soon. They're weakening him, but uh, they, they need to do better. Because right now, the field against him is so weak. That's exactly right. This is what is happening right in front of our very eyes. <clears throat> well, the former director of the Federal Bureau of I'm With Her, the dishonorable James Comey, has stated, <clears throat> has stated and written in his book, that the reason that he briefed Trump at Trump Tower in January of 2017 was to make the incoming president aware of the salacious allegations against him and that the media was about to release it. <clears throat> of course, we know now that that was a lie. Comey's goal was to provide the news hook for CNN to report on the dossier allegations uh, and that uh, Trump had been briefed on it, and it was likely leaked to CNN by Clapper. Now, we have a new book by Comey's chief of staff, Josh Campbell, who is now a CNN analyst. In his book, he says that Comey requested a top-secret laptop to be made available to him in his FBI vehicle so that he could write notes of the meeting as soon as possible. Uh, after meeting with Trump in Trump Tower. Campbell also says that Comey had never made such a request before. And of course, we learned this in the Mueller report. So now we know where Uncle Bob, the executioner's team, got that information about all that happened after the uh, Trump Tower meeting with Comey, when Comey briefed Trump. He went out to his vehicle where he had this top secret laptop. He typed in his notes. Then he had a went to a, a, another uh, uh, New York FBI field office where he uh, had a teleconference call with members of the, uh, of the uh, team, I guess you would say, Strzok, Page, McCabe, and the, and the crew. And uh, they had this teleconference meeting, and all this information was used as part of the counterintelligence operation. It was an effort by Comey to entrap Trump. That's what we learned from the Mueller report. And now we, uh, from the, I'm sorry, the IG report on uh, Comey. And now we know where the IG, the Inspector General, uh, got his information. Obviously, it was from his interview with Josh Campbell. Of course, the IG report makes it quite clear that Comey, Brennan, and Clapper wanted to use the meeting to try and entrap Trump and to gather information from Trump that could be used against him. That's right. <clears throat> well, well, well. We just talked, what, yesterday or day before yesterday? It's hard to remember. <laughs> it was either yesterday or the day before yesterday. We talked about uh, Judicial Watch uh, putting together the testimony of Felix Sater from the Mueller report along with... Uh, um, other testimony from Felix Sater from uh, congressional hearings as well as other documents that uh, Judo Ju Judicial Watch has received 
through FOIA request over the past two years and a total analysis of all of everything they've got on Felix Sater, Tom Fitton was able to determine that um, Sater was likely, we, we know he was now working for the FBI and the intelligence community, he was the one who was pushing the Trump Tower Moscow thing. And so, as we learned from the video yesterday or day before, that in fact this was, this was very likely just another entrapment scheme. And in this particular case, uh, the deep state was using Felix Sater. Felix Sater. So now, having discovered this, and having done the video and put it up on Judicial Watch's website explaining all this and where the information came from, they have now taken the next step. So Judicial Watch is now suing the FBI for 302s on Felix Sater. 302s on Felix Sater. Exactly. They want to find out if Sater was involved in any briefings with the FBI or the intelligence community or had any inter interaction with them prior to, uh, uh, I wouldn't say prior to, but during 2016, maybe going back to 2015. In other words, he wants to see if the FBI or the intelligence community were working with Sater uh, to motivate him to put pressure on Michael Cohen to push Trump into this Trump Tower Moscow project. That, that's obviously what you're looking for here. And uh, we will see how forthcoming uh, the FBI is with any 302s that they have on Felix Sater. And they should have a bunch. They should have a bunch. Because he has been an FBI informant for 20 years or more. So we will see how that turns out. So while the rotten Reverend Clinton was in Italy, do you think by any chance she may have met with Mifsud and his friends. Hmm. She was in Italy and she didn't go there just for the hell of it. She didn't go there just for a visit. That entire Italy trip was a staged event. <clears throat> now when the Clintons stage an event, it is to distract you from what they're doing over here. They get you looking over here so that you don't pay attention to what they're doing over here. So she went to Italy for some reason, and it wasn't to sit at that fake uh, Oval Office desk and, pr and pretend to read her emails at this art exhibit. That's not why she went. She went there for a totally different reason, I can assure you. And with everything that's going down in Italy right now, she probably wants to find out what the hell is going on. She wants to find out what her liability is, what her exposure is. Now we know that Mifsud claims to have been a friend of Hillary Clinton. We're told that he's had dinner with her at least once. He claims to be a member of the Clinton Foundation, and as far as we know, there's no such thing. He claims to have made donations to the Clinton Foundation. He is a big supporter of the rotten Reverend Clinton. He also is a key player a major key player in the entire plot. Now here's a good question. What do you think the odds are that it may have been the rotten reverend who brought Mifsud into the, into the game? I mean, we assume that it was maybe Brennan, or maybe Halper, or maybe, uh, you know, the Italian government or someone. Those are the people that we've been focused on as to who brought in Mifsud, but when you look at Mifsud's connections to Clinton, and you look at Downer's connection to Clinton, and both Mifsud and Downer were in on the Papagalopoulos frame-up, they're both friends, longtime friends of the Rotten Reverend, big supporters of the Rotten Reverend, both hated Trump. What is the possibility that we may find that it was the rotten reverend who brought in Mifsud. I would not put that out of the realm of possibility. Well, we had uh, Saggy Daniels. That's right, you thought Horseface was going to go away, but not that quick. 
So Saggy Daniels is uh, speaking at an LGBTQ fundraiser, and she says that uh, she is supporting Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> but then she goes on to say that if Avenetti runs, and he's threatening he's going to run in 2020, uh, she said if Avenetti runs, that she will jump in the race too, <laughs> so that she can start a GoFundMe and smear Avenetti. <laughs> Do you know how much fun that would be? Let's just say that uh, let's just say that Crazy Joe drops out, and the Rotten Reverend goes, "Great, it worked. I got Biden out. Now we start the draft Hillary campaign." And just about that time, here comes Avenetti with a press conference. <laughs> Followed by Saggy with with a press conference and a GoFundMe. <laughs> And you know, this would fit perfectly well. I mean, there's plenty of room in the clown car for Avenetti and Saggy. Plenty. Well, you can get Avenetti in there. Saggy, I don't know. Saggy, I don't know. But you could probably put her up front, maybe on the hood, as a hood ornament. Uh, wouldn't be good for aerodynamics, but chances are the clown car doesn't go that fast anyway. Um, so, I mean, the thought of that is just hilarious. Uh, but with this field of the demo commies and this clown car, as crazy as these people are, I wouldn't be surprised at all because, you know, I mean, I know you're probably thinking, no, no. Well, all you got to do is go back and watch some of these compilation clips. I know Tucker Carlson did one a couple of months ago. It was, it was a compilation of probably lasted 10 minutes of nothing but CNN, MSNBC, various other left-wing outlets praising Avenatti, talking about how, how, how he would be this great candidate to stand up to Trump, how he would be this super awesome candidate, you know, because he's so smart and so skilled and so, you know, and he can, he can, he can debate Trump, you know, he's, he's got the same skills and stuff like that. They were making Avenatti out to be like something great and really taking him seriously as a presidential candidate. And that went to his head. I mean, this guy actually believes that. Now, he believed all that. And, uh, of course, he's facing God knows how many felonious counts <clears throat> of crimes. But these people are so arrogant. It's like people say, well, I, you know, the rotten Reverend Clinton, she would never run. She's, you know, there's too much heat on her right now. Too many crimes, you know. And it's like I've told people before. She could literally get indicted and she would still run. She would just come out and say, well, I'm being indicted because it's the uh, uh, right-wing conspiracy against me. And, uh, you know, uh, she would use that, try to spin that in her favor to get more of her supporters even more uh, excited about her and to defend her and, and things like that. I mean, this is a woman who has no shame. The Clintons have no shame, folks. None. I remember back in the uh, 90s when they released their tax returns. And we learned that they take tax write-offs for donating their used underwear. They take tax deductions for their used underwear. Now, I've donated old coats that I've grown out of, uh, jeans that I've grown out of, um, some shirts and things like that to the Salvation Army or what have you. I've never taken a tax deduction for it. Um, I just do it. You know, I can't wear these clothes anymore. Why not give them to someone who can? A lot of times they're very nice clothes. Sometimes things I've literally worn one or two times. Uh, or clothes I just bought that I thought looked good or fit good and turned out they didn't. Um, I wear them one time and go, Ugh. You know, but someone else would maybe love them, right? But here's the Clintons. They list their underwear as tax deductions. Who gives, who, 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 who donates their used underwear? I know people that you donate a lot of used stuff, but I don't know anyone who has ever donated used underwear. That's what the Clintons do, and then take a tax deduction for it. And you think that the rotten Reverend Clinton, she would run her campaign from freaking jail. If she was indicted, arrested, and tossed in the slammer, she would literally run Hillary 2020 out of her jail cell. And I promise you there would be at least 20, maybe 25% of rotten Reverend Clinton supporters who would still vote for her and campaign for her 
and donate to her. She'd probably raise more money in prison than she wish she would on the outside. Guarantee it. Well, here's another troubling poll. Uh, it looks like, and the, again, this is one of these statewide polls, and these are polls that are polling people. And these are, the thing about these state polls, when are, this is to try to find out how things are going to look in a primary in the state. And most of the time, they're working from list of definitely registered voters or likely voters uh, who are of that party, the Democrat Party. So there's no Republicans mixed in here. There's no, you know, independents. These are people registered as Democrats. In this poll, Bernie is tied with Biden in California. And Harris, legs in the air Harris, is literally rock bottom. She's below Andrew Yang in California. Now, that's her home state. What's that tell you? <laughs> Tells you a lot of people in California know a lot about legs in the air Harris. And they know she's an idiot. Stone cold idiot. Dumber than a turnip. And I think in that last debate, she was stoned. I really do. I think she was stoned. On something. I mean, they have legal weed out there in California. She probably smoked up some of that white, uh, what do they call it? The, uh, the, the killer stuff. Uh, I forget what they call it, but they got some real, some real kick-ass weed out there. <laughs> and I think she smoked some of it for that debate. But the thing about Bernie is there are certain places where he is really strong. Now, most of the country, he's really weak. I mean, Bernie is horribly weak in the South. He's horribly weak in the Southwest. But he polls really, really well in the Northeast and in the uh, uh, West Coast and the Northwest. He polls very strong. California, he's got a lot of supporters in California. He's more popular in California than the Rotten Reverend. And if you remember in 2016, what they did to him in California, they literally announced, I was sitting here at my computer, I'll never forget it. The polls were going to open the following morning in California. They're three hours behind us here. So it was like 10 o'clock here in my time, which means it was probably uh, 7 o'clock p.m. or so the night before uh, the primary in California. And they literally started announcing that Hillary won California at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which would have been 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific Time, were announcing that Hillary had already won California. And I thought, I've, I don't think I've ever seen this before, where they literally announced someone solidly winning the state you know, 12 hours before the polls even open. I thought that was pretty extraordinary, uh, but that's how that's how frightened that they were, that Clinton was, that Bernie was going to win California. And, uh, of course, once they announced that Hillary won California, there was no reason for people to go vote. <laughs> Bernie, Ber Bernie Sanders supporters, I'm saying. Why do it? So, um... I know Bernie's popular in California, more popular than the Rotten Reverend, probably more popular than Warren. And when you get into these caucus states and you get into the Northeast, uh, and that's why I say you have to look at the way that the Democratic primary is laid out. It favors, in a lot of ways, Bernie Sanders. If he can stick around for the first five, six, seven primaries, you know, with those caucus, there's two or three caucus states in there. You've got two states, uh, one in the Northeast. You've got the big state of California and all those electoral votes. Uh, if Bernie carries California, he could very well jump into front-runner status. Again, this is why I believe that, that if the rotten Reverend Clinton, if she does not jump in the race, if they don't take out Biden and insert the rotten Reverend, this convention will likely be brokered convention. They will go into the convention with no clear winner, front-runner. And that would spell disaster. But boy, would it be fun to watch. <laughs> I'm telling you, we're in for an exciting year, man. This coming year is just going to be an unbelievable, exciting year. We've had three years of just getting kicked in the teeth. It's been very, very difficult, very frustrating. Uh, but I do believe that uh, this is our year. I do believe that uh, in this upcoming year, uh, the, the, the latter quarter of 2019 and 2020, we're going to own them. Own them. Stay tuned. Thank you for tuning in. I'll be back tomorrow with more Tower Gate. See you guys. Bye.